The crew was considered to be adequate. Uh, they were all volunteers, and many of them were looking forward to a voyage to the exotic island of Tahiti. And the Bonnie would spend five months in Tahiti. She would set sail to uh, England in uh, April 1789. 24 days after she left Tahiti, there would be a mutiny. And 18 men, as well as Captain Bly, were put into a 23-foot open boat with some limited rations and cast adrift. The bounty would take Fletcher Christian and the mutineers, and they would head off to unknown, but they would at least go to Tahiti for a while. So here's the question. What happened to the men in the boat? What happened to the mutineers? What was the reaction of the Royal Navy when she discovers that one of her ships has been taken by mutineers? Well, the answers would go back to Bly's log and the Royal Navy records. Bly was a product of the Royal Navy. His entire life was dedicated to the Royal Navy. This is the White Ensign. Only warships and stations are allowed to fly the Royal Ensign. It is symbolic of the greatest navy in the world. During the 1700s, the Royal Navy was the equivalency of Amazon today. It was unparalleled. It was, it was just superb. England's, uh, the status and position of the Navy in the English society was closely associated with concepts of wealth, power, and liberty. England's an island. She depends upon the Navy to protect her. They view the Navy with great favor and they value her. They say the sea is our protecting element. And as long as Britannia rules the waves, nothing can harm us. And rule the waves, she did. Her reputation against foreign fleets was of unparalleled supremacy. The French, the Danes, the Spanish, the Dutch, they all fell to the Royal Navy. Between 1793 and 1815, England would lose 17 frigates to the French, of which nine would be recaptured. In the same period of time, France would lose 229 frigates to the British. British ships sailed all over the world, showing the flag in convoys and military missions or seeking new territories. Her bases were all over the world, Malta, Cape Town, Trincomalee, New South Wales, Gibraltar. It was completely covering every ocean possible. This is the Admiralty Building. Every day of the year, decisions are made uh, assigning Royal Navy ships to various ports. The Admiralty meets, yeah, they meet every single day of the year. Now, it might not be the first sea lord, but it's, it, this is the Navy's Pentagon. This is uh, kind of an old <coughs> sketching. It's of a uh, Royal Navy dockyard. To, to sustain the fleet, the, the, the Navy had dockyards and they had uh, shipbuilding facilities. And they were very, very uh, insistent upon not finding out repairs or requirements or supplies to, the, uh, to private companies. They ran their dockyards. The dockyard at, uh, at Portsmouth employed 14,000 people in 1785. That was the largest commercial venture, uh, commercial facility in the world. In 1795, the Royal Navy had 123 ships of the line. Those would be these, that was the biggest battleship you could uh, have. And 160 cruisers, totaling 99,600 men. Now, to man a fleet like this, enlistments would suffice. They would help, but they wouldn't keep pace with the appetite for men. So there was a policy of impressment. And impressment went back to the feudal days, and that's when there were uh, gangs of men, they were called press gangs, 
and they would go to the waterfront taverns, to brothels, to any place where a lot of seamen or maritime men would be living. And if the press gang thought that he would be a good sailor, they were taken. And he would end up in the Royal Navy on a ship. Now, this is a picture of the typical press gang. It, the logic of it was in the, in the back in the feudal days when the king felt the empire, the kingdom was under, under uh, fear of attack, he had the right to summon all of the able-bodied men to help protect the realm. Uh, legally, there was no law authorizing it, but there was no law saying you couldn't do it. So it became a matter of, uh, it was constantly a source of fresh, fresh horses for the, for the Royal Navy. Impressment is going to become much, much more of a big problem uh, 30 years from now when the uh, War of 1812 breaks up. Impressment's going to be the uh, straw that, one of the straws that breaks the camel's back. <clears throat> a, little, a little bit of talk about the Royal Navy. The, <clears throat> the food chain, the hierarchy in the Royal Navy was commissioned officers at the top, then you had warrant officers, and then you had the uh, petty officers and able seamen. It, it, was, it was almost like a reflection of the social stratus ashore. Commissioned officers they got their commission from the Admiralty. All of them received their training in the Royal Navy, and they had to have at least six years service before you could become a commissioned officer. They were trained in navigation, they were trained in gunnery, seamanship, but they didn't need to be complete specialists in these fields. They had to know the rudiments, and they had to be comfortable with them. But there would be other ranks that would carry out the details. They were going to be more managers and leaders. Commissioned officers could be promoted to positions of involving more than one ship. It was, the parallel would be commissioned officers in the American Navy. Next class down were the warrant officers. They received their commission from a warrant from the Navy Board. They're considered specialists. Uh, the master. The master was the highest warrant officer you could attain that position to. And he was basically, he was, he was in charge of the ship, directly reporting to the captain. Uh, he, would, he was responsible for navigation, setting the course, advising the captain of any dangers. He, he was the captain's right hand man, but he was not a commissioned officer. In the, uh, in the hierarchy of the ranks, Warrant officers were considered, quote, with, but after lieutenants. So there was always a slight stigma between the commissioned officers and the warrant officers. Some of the other positions for a warrant officer, surgeon, the purser, the bosun, the carpenter. Next down the line are the midshipmen. They're going to be potential officers. They have to have at least three years service as a midshipman. And <clears throat> After six years, they can become a lieutenant. A lot of midshipmen came from the landed, landed gentry, or they came from families who had good standing in the community or professional people. Typical age midshipmen, 15 to 20. They learned seamanship, navigation, maintenance of the log, and they had minor responsibilities. Uh, they'd be in charge of some of the ship's boats. They, they would do low-level tasks, but they were on their way to becoming commissioned officers. Next, petty officers. Again, these are men that would work closely with the UR officers. They had a particular trade or skill. And then at the bottom of the food chain are the able seamen. And these are the guys who have to know everything. They have to know how to tie the knots, how to reef the sails, how to heave the lead, handle the pumps, roll the boats. Basically, they have to know how to do everything the officers tell them to do. But it's a way of life. And all of these different stratas are tied in to, um, to, to work effectively under two categories. 
discipline and two philosophies, I'm sorry, discipline and duty. These are the two things that are going to make this, this operation work. Discipline was simply saying to the crew, these are the rules and you abide by the rules. If you don't abide by the rules, this is what happens. And discipline was the punishment for disobeying or not stepping forward when the enemy was there or stealing or conspiring to mutiny. There were 35, either 35 rules. These are the Royal Navy Articles of War. And these tell you in crystal clear terms what happens if you commit one of these 35 offenses. Uh, number 12, every person in the fleet who through cowardice, negligence, or disaffection shall in time of action withdraw or keep back or not come into the fight or engagement or shall not do his utmost to take or destroy the enemy, blah, blah, blah. Every person, every such person so offending shall be convicted thereof by the sentence of a court martial and shall suffer death. Mm. Mutiny. Mutiny was the one thing that there was, there was no division. Mutiny was punishable by death. The the, the, the the assignment of discipline by the officers to the victim while it was very clearly specified, the degree of punishment varied. A midshipman felt that one of the common seamen had stolen a handkerchief from him, and he accused him, the common seaman, of, uh, of theft. And they went before the captain, the captain says, you're right, this is wrong, and the guy got 200 lashes. Wow. wow. This is what? It's, it's not a clear print, but it's a, it's a cat and nine tails. That's a, a, a dollar bill just to show you the size of it. When somebody was disciplined, they would be tied to a hatch, and the, the discipline was always public, very, very public. They'd be tied to the hatch. You would have the entire crew over here. You would have the marine detail up here. You would have the officers <coughs> here. This man is going to do the lashing or the flogging. He is the bosun's mate. That is, if you're the bosun's mate, that's one of your tasks. You always do the flogging. Over here, all of the enlisted men have their hats off because to show respect for the law, the command would be hats off, and they take their hats off. Now, the officers and the Marines keep their hats on. They want to make sure that everybody sees what's going on. Now, he would be flogged, tied to a hatch cover. Another example would be somebody lashed, uh, tied to the, uh, to the side of the ship. If the crime was really severe, and they wanted to make sure that the entire fleet knew what happened, they would take the, the, the guilty man, and they would put him in a boat, and he would be tied to a hatch cover, and he would be rowed from ship to ship to ship to ship to get his lashes. The boatswain on the ship that he belonged to would give him 20 lashes. They'd go to another ship, that boatswain would come down. There were cases where the guilty was assigned 350 lashes. The one particular case where the man had received about 115 lashes and the, and the surgeon goes up to the captain he says, well, you're going to kill him. You're going to kill the guy. He's, he's going to die. And the captain said, very well. And they stopped like at 132 lashes. The guy, they gave the guy two months to get that up and then they gave him the rest. So it was, it was relentless. It just, there was a storm that came up, a sudden squall. And the captain of this frigate, he was known as a tough guy, and he became impatient. He thought, they're taking too long up there. And he called on the midship and he says, tell them that the last two men to come down will get 50 lashes each. And this sparked a race. And two men fell to their death. 
One of them landed about six feet from the captain. The captain walked over, kicks the body, and says, throw them overboard. So, I mean, that's how harsh, harsh the uh, discipline could be. The other principle is duty. And you have to convince the crew that it wasn't optional. You should want to do this. You need, England expects every man to do his duty. This was drummed into you from day one. It's not like you, you thought things over. If the command was given, you do your duty. Lord Horatio Nelson, iconic British naval hero. He, uh, he was as good as they, they come. He just, he was an advocate of good discipline, but also duty. Duty is the glue that holds the Navy together. It takes a crew of raw recruits, seasoned seamen, and it turns them into a cohesive team that will work together in times of calm and in times of great danger. And knowing that each man will do his duty gave the officers a sense of confidence that, yeah, we're going to move forward. His famous quote, England expects that every man will do his duty, Horatio Nelson, just before the Battle of Trafalgar. This is a very romanticized painting. Here's uh, Nelson, he's being carried to his death. Here's a, another romanticized version of him. <coughs> he is inches away from death, and his last words are, thank God I have done my duty. <laughs> All right, this is the Artop, Artocopus incisor. It is a breadfruit plant. The mission of the bounty is the introduction into England of the breadfruit tree as a source of food for the slaves of the plantations in the West Indies. This is not an honorable, noble mission. What they want to do is they want to get these plants from Tahiti to the West Indies to see if they will grow well and hence be a cheap, quick source of food. This is the mastermind behind it. His name is Joseph Banks. He's a wealthy, influential botanist who has been to Tahiti with Captain Cook. He loved Tahitian culture. Uh, and he was the head of the Royal Society. He had vast influence with scientists, politicians, and a very close confidant of King George, who was an amateur botanist. He would be considered a rock star by today's criteria. Everybody liked him. They wanted to be close to him. He knew all the people in power. Once Banks says, I think it's a good idea to send a ship to Tahiti to get pressure plants, the deal's on. Here's another picture. He was a notorious womanizer. This is Captain James Cook. Cook made three journeys throughout the world. He was a, he was a phenomenally uh, brilliant mariner. He discovered all places all over the world. He made three voyages. And if you think, this is England over here. Blue is one, green is another. I mean, he went all over the world. When England would send a ship to a place that they didn't know anything about, it wasn't just the, the captain and the, and the sailors. They would have somebody on that ship who could identify the different plants, flora and fauna. They would have somebody who was very adept at picking up languages. They would be somebody who could do study geology, anything, any aspect of science, because the more they know about this place, the next time they send a trip over there, it will give them a, somewhat of an advantage over the French or the Dutch or the whoever. And so the, the journeys were, yeah, let's go over here. Well, I'm, I'm simplifying what is, let's explore here. Let's get this. Maybe we can claim that. But they wanted to grow the empire. And that's how they did it. They sent ships all over the world. The Spanish, the Dutch, the Portuguese did the same thing, but nobody, nobody was as good as, as the British were. 
Cook goes to all over the world. He ends up on his third voyage in the Pacific. And this is a painting of Tahiti. And it's a tropical, beautiful paradise. And the natives are very, very friendly. And the natives haven't seen any Westerners. And they haven't seen any ships like this. Uh, and Cook was able to win their trust, to win their allegiance. Or they welcomed him, put it, put it that way. They thought he might be a god. They thought he was, well, they called him Lono, L-O-N-O. -O. They thought he was a spiritual god. And he worked pretty well to maintain that image. Uh, very, very smart guy. Well, on his third voyage, this guy is William Bly. He's 21 years old, and he is one excellent navigator and surveyor. You know, to be able to survey and to, to chart things was, was a tremendous skill, and a navigator. Bly was tops on both, both of those aspects. Uh, he worshipped Cook. He thought he, he looked down on the other officers. He wasn't popular. He didn't care if he was liked or not. Uh, they thought he was thin-skinned and intolerant. He was present on Cook's third voyage when Cook was murdered in Hawaii by the hostile natives. 1787, this is the man that's appointed to lead, uh, to, to take the, the ship to, uh, to Tahiti. Uh, 34 years old, average height, and a very pale, marble-like complexion. He had the reputation of being an excellent mariner and a surveyor. Uh, a lot of this was a result of his close affiliation with Captain Cook. The bounty. Lying low and solid in the water, the bounty was described by Bly as my little ship. She had three masts, a square stern and a blunt nose. Her figurehead head was a carved statue of a lady dressed in riding habit. But he had to be somewhat disappointed because he's in the Royal Navy and there's a lot of tremendous ships out there, and this is not one of them. She's 85 and a half feet long, and she's described as a cutter. Well, as a cutter, she will not warrant having a captain, only a lieutenant. And she will also not have a marine detachment, nor will she have any other commissioned officers. So the only commissioned officer on the bounty is going to be William Bly. Space is going to be a premium because she's modified this whole area in here, on well, the back side here, is reserved. That would be the captain's great cabin. Well, that's all going to be reserved for plants on the voyage back. And this is looking down. These are all going to be containers for the plants. This is the captain's cabin, and this is the master's cabin. These are eight feet by seven feet, so we're not talking spacious accommodations. And this is the one deck and another deck of plants. <coughs> She's going to carry 629 pots back. That's, that's the, the hope. Uh, She's going to have no Marines. She's going to have no commissioned officers. She will have some warrant officers. And this is uh, John Fryer. He is the master. He's going to be the basically number two in command. But he's, he's only a warrant officer. And some of the other warrant officers will be uh, the surgeon, a fellow named Thomas Huggin, uh, the bosun's mate. And she's going to have three, three midshipmen all from relative good families. One of them, Fletcher Christians, from a very, very prominent family. Total crew, 46 men. And they're going to live in a space. 33 men are going to live in a space of uh, 22 feet by 36 feet with a ceiling. The ceiling, deck to floor, is uh, 5 feet 7 inches. It's okay because they are within compliance of the Royal Navy's allotment of sleep per man, which was 14 inches. 
So your hammock space was 14 inches wide. Here's Fletcher Christian. He was very patrician, very, it was almost like a bulby bone. Here he is again, he's standing, his battery's gone, yes, but he's up here, and you can see the man hauling in the sails and everybody, but there, this man's got his hat off to him because officers warranted uh, respect. This is a you know, replica of the bounty. She was the exact same details, uh, same configuration, everything, and she sank in a hurricane a number of years ago. I'm pretty sure one of the people on her was a great, 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 great niece or something of one of the people involved in the bombing. October 9th, she is piloted down the Thames to receive guns, armor, ammunition. Now she's an armed transport. Finally, December 23rd, she sets sail. Terrible gales and delays are going to delay her. Bly wanted to leave maybe, maybe middle of November at the latest. And the Admiralty did not attach a lot of uh, prominence to this mission. They dragged their feet. He doesn't leave until December the 23rd. And <clears throat> as soon as they, uh, as soon as they head south, it is miserable weather. December 23rd, severe gales and storms, they slow her down. January the 5th, they finally make Tenerife. They reprovision and they sail January 11th. So they have themselves, they're making progress. Bly, Bly keeps his log meticulously. His log for January 5th. Very pleasant weather, all sails set before the wind. Bly realizes it's essential for the crew to remain in good health and to be kept busy. He learned these lessons on Cook's voyages. He divides the crew into three eight-hour watches rather than the typical four-on and four-off. This lets the men get a chance to sleep better. He is an adam he's adamant that the ship must be kept clean. His crew wash down all areas of the ship with vinegar, air their bedding on a regular basis, clothes are to be kept washed, and the men are to be inspected including fingernails, each Sunday prior to divine services. Now, the lot of the average below deck seaman was not one where he spent a lot of time cleaning his fingernails. These are very hard, coarse people. But Bly was this way. He also knows that the men need to have exercise. So he has them exercise every day between 4 and 8 p.m. He has them exercise, he, he's hired a blind fiddler, and he has them exercise every day by dancing. And the crew hates it, but he thinks it's good for them. February 9th, they cross the equator. He appoints Fletcher Christian as acting lieutenant. Now this is almost a guarantee that at the end of the voyage, Fletcher Christian will be promoted to a lieutenant. To a lieutenant. Continue, continues in his log. Quote, my men, all active good fellows, much content and cheerfulness, always dancing from four to eight. No cause to inflict punishment. He thinks punishment, scurvy, and sickness are signs counter to a well-run ship. Well, it doesn't last forever. He has to issue uh, discipline to, to a fellow named Quinto. Quinto, is a, he's a tough guy. Insubordination, 24 lashes. March. They're headed toward the Falkland Islands. Weather turns, strong gales, exceedingly high sea, snow. They have difficulty taking a go around Cape Horn. That adds 10,000 miles to the trip. Arrives in Cape Town on May 24th. They left December 23rd. Now it's May 24th and they're in Cape Town. Bounties overhauled, rigging, spires, any damage is repair repaired takes on new supplies, meat, cabbage, leeks, and a treat, fresh bread. They spent 38 days in Cape Town. Well, I tours Cape Town with Fletcher, Christ Fletcher Christian, and he's even lending money to Christian. And this is raising a few eyebrows, but nothing much. Uh, another case of punishment, 
Six lashes for John Williams, neglect of duty. The next stop, they leave Cape Town and they are over here in Tasmania and they're headed towards uh, Tahiti ultimately. They send a shore party ashore to, in Tasmania to refill the water casks and cut and gather wood. But a problem develops between Purcell. Purcell is the ship's carpenter. He is insolent and he's sent back to the ship. It was very, very common that the ship's carpenter would always be a tough nut to deal with because they knew they had a valuable job and they knew that nobody else knew what they knew and they, were, they, they always had pretty, pretty tough personalities. Shackleton, in his trip in Antarctica, had 28 men with him. The only guy he had trouble with was the ship's carpenter. They're just they're very, very tough to deal with. So Purcell refuses to carry out orders. Bly knows I should have had the guy court-martialed. I have, should have him locked up. I need him. I need his job. And there's nobody else to support me. So he just talks Purcell into saying, you know, okay, I'll behave and everything. Uh, but Bly also gets his warrant officers together and says, you know, you guys aren't helping me out here. How about some help? Because he's the, he's the only source of discipline. And the, the crew is now starting to notice a little bit of a schism between Bly and Purcell and the warrant officers. September the 5th, she leaves for Tahiti. Bad weather. Fog, heavy rain, heavy high seas. He keeps records. The log reads every the distance per day covered. One day, 177 miles, 145 miles, 171 miles. Just, they, they're making progress, it's just so far away. When, when they reach Tahiti, they will have sailed 28,086 miles. His messmates, Friar, it was common for the officer to invite his other officers or uh, warrant officers to dine with him. Friar says, no, I don't want to eat with him. So he's, uh, he's cut himself off from Bly. And uh, Bly senses that Friar is not really doing a good job, digs out the articles of war, reads them to the entire crew. Resentment is growing. The crew's starting to notice. But so far, things are still OK. Until Bly gets word that there's a sick seaman on board, a guy named James Van uh, Valentine. And there's no prior warning of this. He finds out from the, uh, from the surgeon, Huggin. And he goes, What's the, how come he didn't tell me this? And Huggin goes, well, I don't know. The best you could possibly say about Huggin was he was an absolute drunken sot. <laughs> he did nothing. He just lay up in his quarters and drank himself into oblivion. <laughs> Two days later, Valentine dies. And Bly goes nuts at Huggin. Now he doesn't have a, he hasn't got a healthy crew, he doesn't have a perfect record, and he's really, he's furious because he now finds two other men have screwed him. He takes over their, uh, their diet. Also, two men have refused to dance, so there's cracks in the foundation, so Bly is going to say, okay, that's it. Takes over the diet of the sick men, he adds sauerkraut, malt, mustard, and vinegar, and lo and behold, the men get better. On the 24th of October, the bounty reaches Tahiti. Before they pull into the harbor, all men are expected for venereal diseases. This is the scene, this is the welcoming scene. As she wears into Tahiti, she's greeted by throngs of canoes bearing welcoming natives, fresh fruit, hogs, coconuts, and flowers. The contrast between the English and the Tahitians was marked. Tahitians were tan, slim, perfect white teeth, and smiling. The English were dirty, bow-legged, scarred, and unshaven. But the natives are happy to see this ship because they remember Captain Cook, and they think, ah, Lono has come to visit us again. Bly says to the crew, don't mention a word about Cook being killed. I'll, I'll handle it. 
The last thing he wants is the natives to find out that uh, Cook was killed. Bly says, once we're ashore, I'll meet with the royalty and I'll tell them we want to bring breadfruit plants back to England. And he does that. And the chiefs go, that's what you want? In so many words, he says, yeah, I want to bring these plants back. And the, the island's covered with bread, breadfruit plants, so they go, fine. Because they know they're going to get gifts from the sailors. Bly sets up a compound that will be an area where the plants can be harvested, they can be tended to, they can be uh, watered and made ready, ready for shipment. <clears throat> he also, he realizes that you've got to have some kind of trade policy when you're dealing with the natives, because otherwise it'll be complete mayhem. So he sets up a policy for dealing with the Tatians. One, no man is to suggest Cook had been killed by the natives. Two, no man is to tell of our need for breadfruit until I have told the chiefs. Three, each man gain goodwill of natives, treat them with kindness, not use force to retrieve stolen items, and never fire your weapon except in self-defense. Four, each man to ensure weapons or tools under their care are not stolen. I have no man to trade any part of the king's stores. Six, all boats to be empty at the end of the day. Then he nails the orders to the mast. Because what happens is, canoe after canoe would come up and they would go up to a sailor and then give him a hog, coconuts, and he'd give them a piece of red cloth or he'd give them uh, some iron nails. And so you had to have a way to control this. And once they get ashore, and incidentally, you've been sailing in a small boat since December 23rd, it's now November, and you come into this, which is an absolute beautiful paradise. So <clears throat> once you get to go ashore, life was very, very uh, appealing to the, to the crew. Because the natives would hook up with individual sailors, and they would almost be common law wives. And they would, they would invite the sailors to their homes, the sailors would invite some of the women on board, and it was party, party, party. Everything was very, very uh, fun and relaxing. Uh, it was bound to happen that discipline would erode completely, and this is what happens. It became harder and harder for Bly to control the crew when they're having seriously great time in a beautiful place with beautiful people. Uh, he starts to see an erosion of order. He sees an increase in theft by the Tahitians. He sees insolence. He sees uh, cases of desertion. Three men deserted in uh, January. Bly goes to the native chiefs and he goes, look, it is impossible for these three guys to live on the island without you guys knowing where they are. So until they come back, we're taking three of you guys as hostage. That was an approach that Cook used in a work. Soon enough, the other three guys come back and things are okay. Uh, but the crew, the, the crew's just losing control. They're sleeping on duty. The sails are mildewed. The ship almost runs aground. And here's one of the worst things that could happen. The clock is allowed to run down. A compass is stolen. So all of these things, Bly says to it, again to his warrant officers, yeah, here's another example, you're not doing your job. Bly says, quote, such neglectful and worthless petty officers never was in a ship as are in this. Their conduct in general is so bad. They have drove me to everything. But corporal punishment must follow. He can't flog warrant officers. He can't have midshipmen flogged. All he can do is try to talk him into behavior. He's got no Marines. The only discipline is his. February, February and March, they spend getting the ship ready to go. Plants are carefully stored. Ships recalled, reprovisioned, sails mended. The monsoon had started, adding to the sense of gloom felt by many of the men. They would soon be leaving their friends, <coughs> the lovers, future children, and lifestyle of relaxation. 
ashore, the natives sense the ship's getting ready to leave. Tears and wailing were constant. Bly, thanks, Taina, and Idea, they, they were the two chieftains for their kindness, set sail on April the 5th. She's been in Tahiti 23 weeks. They're headed home. She's headed westward into heavy rain. Crew is in surprisingly good spirits. A week out, she comes across an unknown island, but it was too difficult to go to shore. And at this point in the journey home, events showing the friction between Bly and Christian are starting to surface. Christian is berated by Bly, and he says to Bly, Sir, your abuse is so bad that I cannot do my duty with pleasure. I have been in hell for weeks with you. They continue sailing. They get to another small island, Anamuka. This is where Bly had been with Cook. The thing about Bly is he remembers all these places that he went with Cook, and it's like, it's, a, it's really uh, an advantage. He sends two parties ashore to get wood and water. Uh, natives come up, and they're friendly, but they steal an anchor from the boat and uh, a shovel. And Bly is furious that these things happen, and he accuses Christian of cowardice. He says, why didn't you go after them? And Christian says, we had arms, but you forbade us to use them. Relations are getting worse. April 27th, another rift between Bly and the men. He notices that a pile of coconuts stored topside. All along topside, they had, they had mountains of coconuts. And you know, they consume coconuts every day or whatever. And Bly notices one pile seems smaller. And he queried everybody, and everybody said, no, I didn't take them. And uh, Bly says to Christian, did you take the coconuts? Christian answers Bly, I, I do not know, sir, but I hope you don't think me to be guilty. In a rage, Bly says, yes, you damned hound, I do. God damn you, you scoundrels, you're all thieves. I'll make half of you jump overboard before we, we reach the Endeavour Straits. That was in Australia. He cuts the grog ration. He cuts the ration of yams, which was the only sweet food they had to have. And Christian is flabbergasted. He's almost on the brink of tears. And one of the men comes up to him and he whispers words to the effect that he says, hang in there. It won't be much longer. A couple, 15 minutes later, Blythe's come down. He says, Mr. Christian, would you like to have dinner in my cabin? And Christian says, no, thanks. The next day, Bly goes to his cabin about 10 o'clock at night. Officer of the, de of the Peckover, who was at watch, is relieved by Fletcher Christian at 4 in the morning. Shortly thereafter, Christian, Churchill, Mills, and Burkett, all with arms, awoke Bly. And bring him topside. He's wearing a nightshirt. He's tied securely. He's taunted by several of the men. As the launch was lowered, men who were loyal to Captain Bly were put into this boat. They're getting ready to put Bly into the boat. And Bly says to Christian, he says, consider Mr. Christian, I have a wife and four children. Christian responds, that is the thing. I am in hell, I am in hell. They load the launch with 18 men. They're throwing the planks overboard here. Bly is hollering at them. Some of the men wanted to kill him. Again, the launch is 23 feet long. There's 19 men in it, six feet, nine inches wide. She's got 150 pounds of bread, 32 pounds of pork, five quarts of rum, six bottles of wine, 28 gallons of water. They figure that's enough to last five days. As they were cast off, Bly shouts to the bounty, Never fear, my lads, I'll do you justice if I ever reach England. <coughs> They're sailing along. Bly's 35 years old at the start of the journey. 18 men are in the boat. Some are as loyal as could be. Some hate Bly. They head west toward the Friendly Islands where Bly had visited with Cook. At that time, they were well received by the natives. 
May the second, they landed an island and met by natives who appeared to be menacing and hostile. As tensions increase, the natives begin to clap stones together. So you've got all these natives, and each one of them is holding stones. And the dialogue between Bly and the native chiefs, you can tell, is going downhill. And the natives say, well, why don't you spend the night on, on the island with us? And Bly says, oh, no, we've got to. And the natives say, I'm wondering, well, where is the big ship? And it's, it, things are getting worse and worse, and Bly senses that we've got to get the hell out of here. And meanwhile, the natives are banging rocks together, and it's, it's very, very eerie environment. Bly and the men rush to the boat, to this boat here, and they get in the boat, and the natives are pursuing them, and they're throwing rocks at them and spears, and one man has to get out and cut the anchor rope. And he gets out there to cut the rope, and the natives grab him, and they, they, they kill him. Meanwhile, Bly and the men are in the boat, and they start to, to paddle and get away. The natives are chasing them, they're pursuing them, and they're catching up on them. And Bly says, take off your hat, take off your shirt, throw it, throw it in the water. And sure enough, the boat stopped to pick up the clothing and everything, and that's how they escape. So they make a getaway. They are now headed for Timor, which is a Dutch settlement in the East Indies. They're going to be in the boat for 26 days before they reach land. It's a small island in the New Hebrides. Bly is going to name it Restoration Island because the men forage for oysters and berries. They're going to sleep on dry land, going to stretch their cramped limbs, and they're going to be somewhat refreshed. They explore some other islands off New Holland, and by June 4th, they have cleared the Endeavour Strait and the Barrier Reef. Barrier Reef. They are heading towards Australia. And the Endeavour Strait, the Endeavour was uh, one of Cook's ships, and he discovered the strait. Very, very perilous strait, narrow, shifting tides, everything, but they make it through there. They finally hit a Dutch port, Coupang, uh, on June 14th. They pull into this Dutch settlement. Here's the map. It's a terrible map, but basically they're cast adrift over here. And they go all the way here. This is Australia. This is the Endeavour Strait. And here's Timor. This journey is over 3,600 miles. He doesn't lose a man. And at times they want to kill because he's just total disciplinarian. They spend two months in Kupang. Bly files a report gives a description of the mutineers, and there's a Dutch ship headed for Europe. And uh, they finally, he gets back to Portsmouth, England, March 1790. He's presented to King George, and he tells his story. How did they do it? Well, at the start of the journey, Bly and his men were probably in the best health they could have been. They've been in Tahiti for 23 weeks rested, well-fed, relaxed, emotionally happy. So they leave in good shape. The other thing is, for the first four or five days, it rains. It rains cats and dogs, and they're in an open boat. And they're miserable. And Bly says, take your shirt off, dip it in salt water, Wring it out and put it back on. It'll dry quicker because of the salt water. And it does. I mean, it's little things like this that it's not nuclear medicine, but it helps them. It gives them a little bit of an edge. He is in charge of the rations. He takes a coconut, cuts it in half. A couple pieces of rope, and he makes a scale. For measuring 25 musket balls, would equal one pound. He takes what would be the equivalency, he takes one musket ball, and that's the size of the portion. It's less than an ounce. But that's how he sustains them. And in order to eliminate any sign of favoritism, he cuts 
He does the food rationing, but he doesn't distribute it. What? Because they're all facing him, uh, and he says he doesn't want to distribute it. He says to them, "Which man will have this?" And that's how he distributes the food, so he doesn't get accused of, of favoritism. He sets up a log line, which is basically you, you have a log, you throw it overboard with a certain length of rope, and you calculate how fast it is. And what, I don't know how to do it, but there is a way to do it. And that way, they can measure the distance they have covered. He's an excellent navigator. He never wavers from the sense of duty, no matter what. And he's an excellent map maker. So these are the things, these are how he gets them back. England, they know about the mutiny. It's a, all right, fine, we'll go, we'll go get the mutiny. Yes. They dispatch a ship called the Pandora. Oh, this is the Dutch settlement. Bear in mind, the Dutch were competitors of the, of the English. But the common denominator is that European, so. And he is blind presenting his story. And they can't believe him at first when he tells them what happened. The Pandora. The Pandora is a ship that the Royal Navy sends to Tahiti to capture and bring back the mutineers. Uh, her captain is Edward Edwards. He's no stranger to the crime of mutiny. On an earlier command, he stopped the crime. He stopped the plot of mutiny. Five men were hanged. Two were sentenced to 200 and 500 lashes, and the leader was hung in chains. Edward Edwards is a no-nonsense guy. Pandora makes it to Tahiti, and they search the island, and they are able to identify 14 mutineers who came back to Tahiti. Fletcher Christian takes the bounty after the, after the mutiny, takes it and they, they move, they go to an island, but it doesn't work out. And it's one battle after another with hostile natives. They go back to Haiti and 14 of the mutineers say, we're gonna stay here. Christian says, all right, we're taking on. And so he and the rest of the <coughs> mutineers and a number of Tahitians sail off. <coughs> the point's unknown. The Pandora gets to Tahiti, they capture 14 mutineers, they put them in the boat in a special box, and they're sailing home, and they hit a reef, and the Pandora sinks. And Edwards will not unlock the brig to let the men out. Good job. They were kept in this box in the back here, appropriately called Pandora's Box. The men were, uh, where they were kept there, Four prisoners and 31 crew members died. Uh, they ultimately, now they have to take the same journey that Bly did in an open boat. They ultimately make it back to the Dutch East Indies and ultimately the prisoners get back to England for trial. During the trial of the prisoners, there was a very active campaign to paint Bly as the villain, that the mutineers were forced into such a drastic course by his unrelenting abuse. <coughs> Further, a number of the accused, including Peter Hayward, one of the midshipmen, will use the powerful, fa powerful family connections to plead the case. Some people actually bought that. They go, you know, Fletcher Christian comes from a good family. He's not going to be a mutineer. Bly had to be doing something. Uh, and then this is the dawn of the Romantic Age. Uh, you know, these are good English sailors. They would never be with me. Well, they did. They had the trial of the guilty four were sentenced to be hanged, uh, but only three were hung, and the king would pardon ten, ten were tried, three were hung, two were given the king's mercy. On board HMS Brunswick, October 29th, the gun was fired to announce preparations for executions. Ship's company formed on deck, the guilty were hanged, and their bodies left for two hours. Well, I would make a second voyage to Tahiti. He would bring back the breadfruit. It didn't work out. It wasn't viable. He was given command of the director, a 54-gun frigate, 
And that had a mutiny in 1797. Ultimately, he was found to be innocent and regained command. He performed with bravery in a major victory against the Dutch. Lord Nelson awarded him. He did. Bly was okay as long as he was, he was at sea. He got the position of the governorship of New South Wales, which was not a wise move. He goes to Australia and he just runs up against a stone wall, political corru you know, corruption, everything. Uh, he's forced to go back to England. He dies at age 64 in 1817. So what happened to Christian and the mutineers? They're sailing along and they come across this island, Pitcairn's Island. Pitcairn's Island on the charts was like 45 or 55 miles away from where it really was. Nobody knew anything about it. They discover it. It's very rocky. Very, only one or two places on the entire island that they can uh, launch, launch a boat, go ashore. This guy is at near the end of his life. Bounty Trilogy, 1940 I think it was. This is, you know, it's dated, but it is a great read. And the thing that I noticed about it was, Mutiny on the Bounty and Men Against the Sea. These two were, were really very, very factually based because there were survivors who could tell the details of the first two. On Pitcairn's Island, the amount of people that could tell you what happened was, very, was, was diminished. Anyway, excellent read. Even though it's, it's that all, it was, it's a great story. The other good story on this is by uh, Caroline Alexander, this woman who did a superb job. The book's on the table there. These are drawings by uh, Wyeth, N.C. Wyeth. Here's the bounty she's uh, pulling into Tahiti. Here's Fletcher Christian. He took a life. Um, then you don't be seeing. It's idyllic. I mean, when you consider what they were living under and what they went to. On the other hand, when they walked away from the ship, they walked away from everything. Because the, everybody, anybody in the Navy knew that if they were caught, they would be executed. The mutineers left on Pitcairn's a tough crew, not, not nice people, always fighting always bickering, always trying to do one-upmanship. Very, very harsh. They burnt the bounty because Christian knew that sooner or later they would try to escape. And if they got caught, some of the men would get caught and it would be the end of the story. Christian, the relations between the Tahitians and the Englishmen deteriorate constantly. Thinks it's a downhill slant. They're fighting the Tahitian women. Some of them preferred the Englishmen. The Tahitian men were jealous. It, 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 it was a total breakdown of society. Christian is killed by a native. The last survivor on the island was a guy named John Adams. This is a picture of, uh, actually it could be a picture of Christian and children or John Adams, but this, he's the last white man to survive. Nobody knows anything about them for 25 years. And one day there's an, a British ship and it's sailing along and they see the island and they, get, they go, you know, it looks like it's civilized. It looks like it's, let's get closer. They see smoke coming from campfires and they get closer and they can see a little village square. And a canoe comes out from the island, and there's a couple of guys paddling it, and, and one of them is standing up, and, and they don't know what the language is. Good afternoon, what ship are you from? In perfect English. And they're astounded. And that's how they found out the mutineers were on Pitcairn's Island. Send a boat ashore, and uh, they see the village is laid out. They see Bibles. They see... Uh, Everything is meticulous. It's like a little village, English village. So they go back and uh, they get back to England and they file reports and everything. And that's how they discover what happened. 
the John Adams, he was the last guy to, uh, the last Englishman alive. And uh, yeah, it's an amazing story. Well, once word got back that there were Bibles and there were Christians on the island, there was a huge flood of missionaries headed towards uh, Pitcairn's Island for a while. But uh, a good story. But you know, the Royal Navy is not uh, an organization to mess with. So uh, that concludes my story. So questions, ma'am. You know, good question. Mutinies were, first of all, mutinies were really the last step you could take. If it got to the point you'd taken a mutiny, it was, that was it. Uh, so there were relatively few, mu few mu mutinies, but in the late 1700s, there was this, and then there was a mutiny of a wider scale in Portsmouth Harbor where a bunch of ships, they didn't mutiny so much against the officers, they mutinied for better living conditions, better food, better, better treatment, if you will. It wasn't so much against officers, per se. Uh, that was, there was one in the late 1790s, and then there was one in the early 1800s. And those two did kind of make life better for the, the below deck seamen. You know, I don't know of a lot of mutinies, just a, a few. Sir? I have two questions. Were they pay big salaries or very little low salaries? Dirt. <laughs> Dirt. Yeah. I mean the officers. Well, the officer did okay. Yeah, no. No. Very. And it was yeah, when you th the question I have is why would you why would you do this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know, you live in a place where the ceiling's five feet seven inch. You got a fourteen inch sleeping space. You Your boss that. is wants, wants to hang you in chains. Yeah. How did how was uh, England so strong after losing? I guess it didn't hurt them so much to watch the American Revolution only twenty years before. They thought. Well, it's ten years before. Actually. They thought that uh, one, we were ungrateful. Two, we were rebels. Three, that we we really treated them terribly when they gave us culture and literature and commerce and protection from all the other bad guys. Uh, it, it, they didn't think it was that much of a setback, you know. But I don't think they realized the magnitude of it, you know. But, uh, you know, by the time of, 17, you know, say by 1812, yeah, that was a lot. whole different story because that, now that was competition. It's been so many years later. Yeah, sir. If I understood the itinerary, they left England and I think you said they were near the Falkland Islands. Yep. They and then instead of going around South America, they ended up in Cape Town? Yeah, they wanted to go around South America, but they couldn't make it. They spent three weeks trying to round the horn. After the first week, they were, they were not, they made no headway at all. And after the two weeks subsequent, it was just they, they gave up. So then they went east to Cape Town. Yeah, and then they, you know, so, and, and that ended ten thousand miles. Anyway. <coughs> uh, Is it unusual that they were so healthy? Because you hear of all these stories of people who go on boats and they get sick or they die or they get seasick. Well, see, Bly knew about the keep them healthy and, and, and some of the things were fresh fresh fruit, fresh vegetables. So every time they got a chance ashore, like in Cape Town, they filled up with cabbage and leeks and greens, if you will. Uh, and uh, the, the concept of fighting scurvy was, scurvy was starting to, people were starting to realize Scurvy's caused by not bad people, but by bad diet. And so whatever you can do, the limes, you know, things like that. They've been on Tahiti for five weeks, so that really buoyed their health conditions. I, I was surprised to hear you say that the crew, while they were sailing, were getting drunk. 
to my impression that they didn't have alcohol available to them. No, I don't think they did. I say right. that? I didn't mean to say that. They were dancing, but they weren't. Surgeon. Oh, the surgeon. The surgeon. Well, he was a loan officer. And, yeah, thank you. Yeah, the surgeon could have had some liquor or spirits for medicinal purposes. Yeah, the enlisted, I mean, the common. No, yeah, thank you. Right. Bob, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of record in terms of the discussion and that planning of mutineers, like how they have ah, it. Ah, good question. Good question. Yeah, that's because there are no secrets on an 85-foot boat with 47 men. So the planning, I, I think it was a festering situation that got worse and worse and worse as uh, things deteriorated with Bly and the crew. The, the other thing is Bly was good at some things, but he couldn't read people. You know, he actually, he's showing favoritism to Fletcher Christian. He's lending him money. He's, uh, come Christian, let's walk through Copen, uh, Cape Town. Let's, you know, and the, the crew, it's a small, small compact universe and everybody sees everything. So I think that when, when one of the seamen went up to Christian and said, hey, hang in there, it's not going to be much longer, that's the first instance that, I, that anybody made public about something was going to happen. And uh, Bly, Bly would not, he, couldn't, you know, he wasn't good at uh, reading people. But he didn't, he didn't care either. He didn't have to read them because they have to do what I tell them. And, you know, so on one hand, he wants him dancing, he wants him healthy, he wants him clean, but mentally, he's ignoring him. So, sir? If I remember correctly, in Caroline Alexander's book, she talks a lot about the, the PR campaign. Of, After, uh, yeah. And to what extent do you think that affected the, the story in terms of painting Bly as a bad guy and, and trying, to, trying to resurrect the reputations of some of the the, uh, the uh, more gentlemanly uh, I think I think I think the campaign worked somewhat well, particularly for Peter Hayward, who was one of the subscribers of it. Uh, it. It sure didn't make any difference on the lower ranks. I mean, if anybody benefited from it, uh, it would have been the midshipmen. Uh, Bly weathered it okay uh, because. The, the Royal Navy knew that, you know, all things considered, he's really not as bad as a lot of other officers. His discipline, you know, they considered him a stern dis disciplinarian, but they didn't, he wasn't an ogre. I mean, the guy that had two men kicked, and you know, it was just, so, so uh, you know, good news, bad news, there's always something worse, but, but I think the campaign, it worked somewhat and it might have reaped benefits for the mutiny at Portsmouth X years later, where they were trying to get better working, living and working conditions. It was a factor, but, you know. And, and I don't think it, the Royal Navy was okay with Bly. You know, they might have counseled him a little bit and said, bad mess, but let's move on. Because he had another ship. Anybody How else? many movies have been made of this? Yeah, they had three. So you had three. three yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't see. I watched the one with uh, Mama Brando. Do you remember, any of you remember that movie? Yeah. 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 He was a bit foppish, uh, you know, his accent. And, am I keeping everybody too late? No, another two minutes. Okay. We do close at eight. Okay. So we'll all go to Callahan's after this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, good start, sir. So you, you mentioned there was a second mutiny with Bly. What, what was the reason for that? Well, I think that was that was in 1797. I think I think that was part of the the old, the uh, the movement amongst the fleet in Portsmouth. Hey, we got to have better conditions. Yeah. It was it was it was more. Conditions in the Royal Navy versus being against Bly. That was my interpretation of it. So. Right? Right, wonderful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And before you leave, uh, to follow up on the quest for uh, Empire, 
you want one of these flyers. Our next one will be on February 28th, and that's the USS Constitution and Naval War, 1812. And also, uh, I know uh, Bob has mentioned uh, uh, the Nordhoff book. There's a list that our reference librarian, who's a historian, has put together. You may want a copy. This is more powerful. Yeah, that's the time.